all you summit goers. <laughs> I am uh, so happy to be in introducing you to Binny Dansby here today. Maybe many of you already know her, know of her work. She's one of the uh, earliest rebirthers, has been <laughs> working in this field, especially breathing with newborns, uh, mothers-to-be, uh, just... Binny's, Binny's been hovering around the birth process for 30 or 40 years and linking patterns in birth to issues in relationships and now even greater social issues. So there's a lot to unpack. And, uh, and uh, just one more thing about Binny I love to say is her source process has been uh, one of the modules in my practitioner training as long as she, since she, since she invented them, since she developed that, since she developed the process. So, hi, Biddy. I'm so happy. You're like a sister in the breathing world, for sure. There aren't too many people I know that have been doing uh, rebirthing breath work as long as we have. And so, what a pleasure to have you, and um, welcome. It's very exciting to be here with you in this context. I love it. Yeah. All right, and well, I, let's just dive I, right I, in. I, um, I to, first, it's important that I acknowledge you, Dan, for the huge influence that you are and for the work that you've done to bring breath work to so many people. I know you probably get this, but I, I've just, I've been thinking about it a lot and um, I never do acknowledge you in the way that I feel you should be acknowledged. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm a missionary for the breath. I think anybody who knows me knows that. It's not like a choice. It's like the spirit of breath just picked me up by the scruff of my neck and keeps sticking my nose in other countries and <laughs> groups. So yeah, I think you know, breath is the tool of our day. And breath is the very first relationship that we have in life is with our breath. That's right. So how, how does that, how does our first experience in life and our, when we're just taking that first breath, how does that affect people? And, and I think, I don't, I don't know if it's possible, but there are some people who still believe that uh, our birth and early infancy um, issues don't have an effect on us. I can't imagine there's anybody still on the planet who hasn't made that connection. I find but I that know you. difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you have uh, dove into this more than anyone I know, honestly. And so you are the person to talk to about this issue of birth and how it affects us through life, our relationships, our work, everything. So where would you start? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's start with something that people so seldom think about, and that is that we lived inside the body of another human being. And the fact that we were there and we were being breathed. Mother breathed for us when we were becoming. So coming into the world, coming into this realm was um, our first encounter. It's, uh, you know, like landing on the planet. I, when I feel into it, and I've been in many births, I've been at births in hospital, and I've been at births at home, most of them, at home, into water. I worked with the couple who had the very first water birth in the United States. We, I helped prepare them. But the precious, I mean, you know, I like to ask, was your first breath taken while you were being held by your mother so that your body could get used to the breath or were you startled into it? Most people are startled into that first breath. It's <gasps> which opens the lungs immediately. The lungs have never been opened. They're little 
tiny balloons right in the heart space, right in the heart chakra. And they blast open and that causes valves to open, other ones to close in the heart. The flow of blood completely changes. And <laughs> all the major organs have to come online because nothing is in, when we're in the womb, we're a water mammal. We're being breathed through the umbilical cord and only the nervous system, the brain and the heart are operating. The ears start to work <laughs> and we can hear when mother is upset, when mother's not, we also get the hormonal rushes. So what mother thinks about the world and how she interacts with the world and with her partner um, has an effect on us. But it's, it's, it's a monumental thing to take that first breath because it's, it's our first autonomous act, the first thing that we ever do on our own. And the alchemy of the experiencing the body for the first time and the breath, it, they're inextricably combined. You can't separate birth from breath or the breath from birth. So if we were, um, if we encountered people who were afraid we weren't going to breathe and they rubbed us or swacked us or shook us and at the same time cutting off our supply, then what I have found is that many, many, many people have the breath and fear tied up. I, I'd like to read you something from Ashley Montague, who was a medical doctor, a pathologist. He was an anthropologist, a psychologist. He was an extraordinary man. I did a workshop with him many years ago and fell in love completely and have read all of his books. Oh, not all of the anatomy books, but... <laughs> He wrote a book called Touching the Human Significance of Skin. And he wrote, the need to breathe is so compelling that a three minute denial of it is often sufficient to cause death. The urge to breathe is the most imperative of all man's basic urges and the most auto automatic. The process of learning to breathe is an anxious one. Every breath we take, even as adults, is preceded by a faint phobic stir. He wrote this before we had more knowledge about, about how to take our time and let the umbilical cord drain, let the baby have its trans transfusion, to take our time at birth. But every, every breath we take, even as adults, is preceded by a faint phobic stir. Under conditions of stress, many persons go into labored breathing, reminiscent of breathing at birth. Under such conditions, the person often regresses to fetalized activities and assumes fetal positions. In fear or anxiety, one of the first functions to be affected is breathing. Breathing is indeed is not simply a physiological process, but a part of the way in which an organism behaves. Yeah, it's like we've, like the, the, the secret that's out in the open, you know. Uh, I, you know, I think 
I think of birth as a near-death experience for the infant, you know? It's the closest we come to physical death in this life is, is our birth. I mean, we were in the world of the womb and it came to an end and that journey through the birth canal uh, and what impressions we must, I mean, we, it's not, the part of our brain that, that manages our checkbook isn't able to access these kinds of experiences and yet we all carry them in our body. And um, so there's also this idea about thought being creative and, and how those first few impressions that we have kind of give us maybe even habits of thinking or tendencies, psychological tendencies, emotional tendencies. And, and I guess that's why when we play with the breath, it starts to awaken so many emotions, so many memories, so uh, many physical sensations. We're actually stirring up these early memories that are left in the body from birth. And it's really interesting because when I first entered, you know, the breathwork world, once I come out of the military and I had the military breathing under my belt, the first thing I encountered was Vipassana meditation. Mm -hmm. And Vipassana meditation makes you sit very still for hours and hours. And everything inside of you just wants to jump and boil and run and scream and cry. It's so torturous. But then after I had my first breath. rebirthing session, I could sit in meditation for hours effortlessly. It was just like, what happened? Suddenly, I could reach that state of quietness and peace so easily. It, it's as if my nervous, like when I was being born, something got short-circuited and, and, and parts of me kind of never really uh, <laughs> were able to settle into this place. That's right. So how, how do you... Tell us more about your experience in making these connections between birth and and who and how we are in the world. Well, you know, I think probably our first encounter with anything has a great, a very deep uh, impact. And my first encounter with working with Leonard before he knew it was about the breath... <laughs> Take the snorkel, get in the water naked, <laughs> and breathe, and see what happens. And uh, my, I went directly, and I, I think it was because I'd had a lot of therapy before that. I had also been working with the breath in yoga for many years, and as a singer. So I, I have a, I've had since I was. Uh, 12 years old, a very intimate relationship with my breath as support for movement, support for giving birth. I had given birth twice. So when I um, had my first session with Leonard, um, we read this little piece from um, Birth Without Violence and then I went into the water and it was not long, I'm told, that, um, well, it certainly wasn't long before I went into an altered state, completely altered. And the next thing I knew consciously was I was curled up outside this sunken jacuzzi bathtub <laughs> that I was in. I had sort of levitated, the people who were sitting there watching told me. I just, I, I came out and when I came to conscious awareness, I was curled up in Alana Lenz's lap saying, sobbing. I mean, I was literally sobbing. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. And I really got at a very, very deep level that I had always been affected by guilt. I had been run by the, the guilt I had about my mother's pain at my birth. 
I've also come to realize over time that it was my own pain. Mother and baby are having the same experience. Mothers need their babies as much as babies need their mothers. To expect a woman to move, go through labor, and labor does not necessarily have to be this major drama that is portrayed in movies and on television and, and what happens when women go into a hospital situation without um, preparation. Um, the truth is, uh, labor can be an exceedingly empowering experience. More energy moving through the body. I had an orgasm when I gave birth the second time. Um, it's a very sensual and, and we, it should be expanding just like birth should be expanding. Most babies startled into the breath go, ah! and then they shut down and they literally, you can see it happen. They, you know. So what's happening inside is we're shutting down our hearts. And every time we take a breath, there is, mm, is that going to happen again, that explosion? And at the same time, I, I, it's not just with the, what's going on internally. They cut off our supply. They cut the umbilical cord so quickly. There is blood in that placenta that's called the birth transfusion, the placental transfusion. It's the baby's blood. Like a third of our blood supply is there. And so, you know, the body's got to make that blood, make up that blood. But we're cut off. So here we are. We've exploded with the first breath. Am I going to take another deep breath? But I have to, I have to in order to stay alive. So this imperative sets up a conflict. I'm terrified of it. What if I explode and I have to? <laughs> it's a conundrum, it's a conflict. <laughs> And so what do I decide? I, whoa, it's dangerous here. <laughs> Did I make the right decision? I'm telling you, I've encountered that thought so many times from people. Um, it also can result in people not being able to make decisions. You know, it's like, oh gosh, I don't know. There's not enough. There's not enough, not enough air not enough mother. We have been nine months inside the body of another human being and all of a sudden we're out here. So I think, I mean, and I've heard, you know, it's like I developed these archetypal affirmations to work with the breath because Actually, when we breathe and pay attention to the truth, anything unlike it in our systems will come to the surface. So thought is creative and the breath are what's needed for any result. That's the creative process. We have a thought we add our energy to it, our breath, and we have a result. It's in nature. It's conception, pregnancy, birth. So working with birth is not, I, I mean, I'm an artist. I've been an artist for lifetimes. I wanted to understand the creative process. And the breath is vital to that. Life energy is vital to the creative process. We can have, a, you know, we have 
thousands of thoughts available to us every day, where do we place our attention? And if my attention, if that throbbing resonance in me is, it's not safe to be here. I've done something wrong. I don't know what it is. There's no one here for me. What am I to do? I have no choice. That infant has no choice. They can't say, don't do that. <laughs> they have no, and, and, and they're taken away from the familiar. I think that's the, if I have a message for the world, <laughs> it's don't separate babies from their mothers. Let that baby go there and breathe with her. Let the breath come into every cell. It's spirit in form. The breath, spiritus, is the breath in so many languages. We bring spirit into form with the first breath. And if it hurt us, well, you know, I'm uh, not going to have such a great relationship with <laughs> the world because we pull it all in. The fear, the it's body, mind, spirit. Mm. So that first breath is so very deeply important. Look at the greed that we see every day in the news, on the planet, people that comes, greed, I believe, and all addiction is based in the thought, there's not enough for me. There's not enough air. There's not enough blood. There's not enough love. We encounter that at our births. So every breath session, um, I was asked, and, and there's a little video <laughs> talking about it. I was asked um, what advice I give um, breath workers about how to work with someone with birth issues. And my belief is that all issues are birth <laughs> issues. <laughs> that if we can get, you know, I had a psychology teacher many years ago in New York University who said to us that all human experience stacks up like a stack of books. And so if you go to um, a therapy session and you talk about what happened last week or even when you were 10 and you talk about it and you resolve that issue, then everything that was stacked on top of it falls down. So when I became involved with rebirthing and then deeply um, supporting birth and looking at and studying birth and what that effect had, I realized that that's pretty much the, on the bottom of the stack. That's a very low on the stack. <laughs> and if I could pull that out, use the breath to enliven thoughts like my body is safe and I'm innocent, which believe me, every, what I term enlightened experiences that I've had, which are full body felt, light changes, everything, you know, is <laughs> everything changes for a moment in time. Every one of them has been caused by working with the breath and a high thought. Yeah, I, and I think for people, you mentioned Leonard, of course, we're talking about Leonard Orr, and also Stan Groff had this, has a lovely model of the, oh, you know, the yes. perinatal matrices and, and how people don't understand how powerful these early events are in 
in setting up my habits and patterns and tendencies, right? And uh, so it seems to me that the breath helps us to get under all that stuff. As you mentioned, if you have this stack of books and you're trying to get to the first one, all the others are kind of built on top of it. It takes a long time to work through all that stuff and finally get to the real source of everything. And maybe people never even get there. They work through all kinds of stuff, but they never get to that the real source, the original source of their pain, of their suffering, of their limitations, of their urges, of their compulsions and all that stuff. So how... How, how exactly do you, do you personally work with the breath in order to help people to safely not just access these memories, but to release the energy of them from their system so that they feel more whole and more present and, and more together? Um, because I feel like birth creates this, and maybe just my own experience and, and working with others, but creates kind of a split in ourselves. And one part of us is always, from then on, is always dealing with or fighting with or managing another part of us that we're either afraid of or that we, it's just too intense or, or we've just forgotten. So how, how, do you, how do you begin to move into this process? Because a good friend of mine, Mike White, said he was afraid of rebirthing for many, many years because he said, it's like setting off a bomb in your basement. <laughs> and, and you need to be prepared for what's going to come up. And you need to just, you know. So how do you, how do you work with people and work with the breath in order to gently and safely, um, well, clear this early stuff? Um, I start with safe and supported no one reveals themselves to another human being and actually to themselves until they know that they're safe and that they're supported. So my, my life has been, and since, well, for the last 45 years, has been about creating safety for myself within myself, working with my own nervous system so that I am a safe space for people, quite literally. Um, I've had people tell me in my, in my trainings and everything, I've never felt so afraid in my whole life. And that's because this space is so safe that the fear can come to the surface. Now, the breath, gently, fully, I have people breathe in the way they took their first breath, generally. Not, not because I think it's the only way to breathe. I'm, I, I love all forms. If you're paying attention to the breath, you're doing okay. <laughs> but, and in my form, I have people breathe through a relaxed jaw, an open throat into the heart space, which is the way you took your first breath. So going directly to that, that issue, but doing it in a safe environment and doing it consistently. So keeping the breath connected and being reminded that you are safe and I'm here for you. That's first step. Bottom line, the creation of a safe space. And with the intention, knowing that the intention is that's where we're going, what we're going for. It's not about, yes, it's of course relieves stress. And uh, being brilliant every day. Uh, oh, Tom Watson, I think it is, has this wonderful um, uh, YouTube, uh, two YouTube things about being brilliant every day, you know, connecting the breath and working with the breath. Um, there are so many forms and so many intentions. 
I want in source work, I want to support people to get to the source of their pain, get to the source of their negative thinking, get to the birth experience, the source experience. And so consequently, we work with safety, support, safe to feel. Birth was sensory overload for most people. You know, a baby born into water gets to come into the water, into loving hands, unfold, okay? It's like, whoa. I mean, the first one shared this big water pool with his parents. So he came into a womb where his parents were, right? And then gently coming up. So Joseph Tilton Pierce said uh, that the best matrix for learning is to be able to come into the, come into the unknown and still be able to refer back to the known, which is one of the reasons why we thought water would be the perfect medium to be given birth, to give birth in, because the baby could come from water into water and be there and unfold and then come into air with mother and be able to refer back to the water because they're both there in the water together. To be able to refer back to mother, whatever is happening, mother is there, that's the familiar. I have a client who spoke to me oh, just a few weeks ago and she called me and she said, my baby just is crying. She said, he, he doesn't like to sleep. And she said, we have him in the swing and sometimes he sleeps. I said, wear him. He was an emergency C-section. He got taken away from her. And that baby boy remembers. I got a picture like several hours later and she had him in the, in the rebosa, you know, on her. Peaceful with a big, <laughs> yep, that's right. You know, he just went, mm. That we are one with our babies and um, we need to accept that and not, oh, he's out. Now you go over there and I'll go over here. No, 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 no. You want a peaceful child and a, and a you know, a happy teenager. Because, <laughs> you know, at teenage, we go through birth again. Yeah. Starting off with, we just don't want whatever is that we're clear of. We know what we don't want, right? And it's even embarrassing to have parents, I think, <laughs> during those teen years. <laughs> I didn't have any of those difficulties, and it's not, it is because of his birth with my second son. My second son and I have had one major argument, <laughs> and it was about where he was going to get married. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, you know? <laughs> but in terms of his, uh, his, he's always just understood me, and I understand him, and we had we don't have a conflict. But then I re got him from my inside and put him on my outside. It's such a natural thing, isn't it? It's such yeah. a a simple, basic thing. And it seems like the medical world, you know, this, they, they come in like in a wedge and they turn a natural process into a medical emergency and they, uh, you know, sterilize and bright lights and air conditioning and there, there are uh, so stuff in your eyes and you so many. Wow, and you're just, all that time you're just longing to like, be, where am I? What happened? I want to go home. <laughs> and I think that reconnecting you know, reconnecting with those early experience opens the door to the ecstasy that preceded it, that, that, and, and all the way to, you know, the source of our being. And that's why I love your work, the source process, because it just, it, 
It clears the way to reconnect with our original spirit, our essence. And well, until our, then, our it's essence, buried in the trauma. Our true, our true defenses and sensitivity. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're walking around with this existential fear that somebody's going to hit you at any moment, or am I going to, you know, do something wrong? And, the, and there's not enough for me, and I have to, you know, grab, and, and, and I'm always in protection. I don't have access to my true sensitivity. Mm-hmm. I have a nervous system as refined as that deer. You know, have you ever seen a deer on a hill, and it's just beautiful and still, and all of a sudden it jumps and runs? And then... Five, ten minutes later, you see a hunter coming. That deer knew that that was happening. We have that sensitive a nervous system, but we don't have it if we're afraid of the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Unless the other intends to attack us. I, I feel so strongly about the affirmation, my body is safe, no matter how I might be feeling. And the integration of that thought, because it has made me exceedingly sensitive to when there is danger, when there is a reason for me to step out of the way, Move over here. You know, it's like, you know, you say, follow your gut. Well, you can't follow your gut. You can't follow your instincts if you're always afraid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And, and I guess most people are living always afraid, but because they're always feeling it, they don't even recognize it. You know, it's like the hum of my refrigerator in my house. It's always going and I don't notice it. Somebody walks into the house and they go, what's that noise? I go, what noise? Oh, that's the hum of the, it's it's there all the time. And so it doesn't register in me anymore. And that's kind of a sad, Uh, experience, the fact that we are cut off somehow from some of the most beautiful feelings um, because they're buried under this trauma of birth, you know? So let's talk a little bit. um, You mentioned mentioned that one feeling that one of your, what do you call them, archetypal affirmations that I'm safe no matter how I may be feeling. And the other one, there's one of them that just, I'll tell you. My body is you know, I had done a lot of work I, on myself. What's that? I, not I am safe. My body is safe. My ah, body yeah. and I am are not the same. Yeah. I am not my body. And that's a distinct. They are. These are very, very powerful. And I call you archetypal affirmations because they sort of, neutralize or they, uh, they, they create some balance from thoughts we're already holding unconsciously and don't know it. And one of them, I'll tell you, I mean, I have been doing, I've done a lot of work on myself. I've been doing a lot of rebirthing. When I read the first time I read your archetypal affirmations, the one that just totally lit me up and I lived with it for weeks afterwards is I am the one who chooses what to think and what to do with my energy. And I never realized that I had been under a spell my whole life or under an illusion or a delusion that other people were responsible for what I was paying attention to, for what, how I was, what I was thinking about. And that one seed thought just melted so much stuff off me that I am the one, and I need to remember this, and I think everybody needs to remember that I, no matter what's happening, I am the one who chooses what to focus on, what to think about, and more, what to do with my energy. So we're starting to move into your archetypal affirmations. We better back up a little bit. Your thought and your energy create your your next moment in time. They create your experience of of life. And birth is sensory overload. It's we don't have a choice. 
we have no choices. And many women, you know, act that out in their birthing experiences. They just go in and, you know, I know when I gave birth the first time, I definitely thought that if I, that if I went to the very best obstetrician in town, uh, he was also quite handsome, uh, that he'd have my baby for me, you know. He didn't. <laughs> There have often been people who have come to me thinking that I would, you know, quite possibly be able to heal their births for them. <laughs> That's not possible. This is your experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I it's really am quite beautiful. responsible for the thoughts that I choose to give attention to. Mm. Just like I'm mm. responsible for watering the plants in my house, you know. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I think it was Phil Lout used to say, you know, our mind is like <clears throat> our house and we have a right to furnish it however we want. We can choose the colors, we can choose the wallpaper, we can choose the... And so just like our house, we can choose what thoughts, uh, you know, what, what, what's our mind, what's happening in our mind. And a lot of people feel helpless and there's a birth pattern right off the bat. People go, oh, you know, it's too hard. I can't do it. There's nothing I can do about it. I, when I hear people talking like that, I see a little infant who is helpless because, hey, they could throw you out the window. They could flush it down the toilet. What, what, you can, what can you do about it? But when I hear people still expressing those kind of victim mentality thoughts, helplessness and hopelessness, that's how I zero in on anger. birth trauma. Darling, <laughs> anger in my cosmology, anger is, is being triggered, being truly all of your life passion with a, with a thought attached to it, helpless, hopeless, powerless to do anything about this. Mm. So, you know, when I get triggered and my rage comes up, you know, I go, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> How am I going to use this energy? Because it's fabulous. <sighs> you, can, you can move a mountain with it. Mm. And so, but we keep it down because, oh my God, you know, I can't let all that energy come out. Well, I use this energy to heal myself and to stay alive. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I guess it is kind of human nature, a pattern that we tend to use our own energy against ourselves, mm -hmm. which, which when you step back and you see it all the time, you know, people doing things they know they don't need to do and don't want to do and shouldn't do, but they still do them. Or they, they want to do things that they know they should do and they won't. And so... That to me, that's, that's the birth trauma expressing itself. And if we could get under it with the breath and clear that, imagine how much more creativity we would have, how many problems would just disappear because we're creating them unconsciously without realizing it and then having to deal with them. So we've got, we've got about 15 to 20 minutes at, that I'd like to put aside right now. And maybe if you could guide people through a little experience just to kind of get a taste of how do we come into being in a point of power when these, when we get hijacked, you know, by, by this energy and by these feelings. So I invite you then to close your eyes and yawn. Take a long, deep breath and bring it into your heart space what I call the creation space. It'll fall down into your belly. And as it a matter of fact, as you open your heart more and more, there will be no problem with breathing with your whole body. Connect the inhale and the exhale. Relax your shoulders.
and check in with your physical body where you are right now in time and space. And acknowledge that your body is safe. No matter how it might be feeling, those feelings are sensations and sensations are communications. The breath gives you access to all the sensations in your precious physical body. This body is your relationship, your primary relationship in this time and space. Breathe fully and imagine the breath going to every cell, the heart opening to make room to make room for receiving and sensing the support that's here. Just feel the chair or the couch or wherever you happen to be right now. And let your body be a little heavier. It's safe and support is there. So you can just let go a little deeper, a little more. Breathing fully as you sense and let yourself feel all the sensations in your body. your toes, your ankles. Check in. Are the muscles in your thighs relaxed, your inner thighs? Is your back supported? Feel the breath Fill your heart space and fall down into your belly. Every sensation, absolutely safe. Expanding, expanding your heart space, expanding your solar plexus. I invite you to acknowledge that all of this energy registering in your body is safe. You are the one who chooses where to put your attention. You're the one who chooses how to use your precious life energy. And I invite you to choose in this moment with me to remember that you are an innocent expression of love. Innocence is the essence of your being. Pure light at the core. Every conscious breath expanding, making room for the expansion of that core of light at the center of being. 
every thought that is the truth, expanding that core of light energy. I am the innocent, the innocent child of a gentle, gentle universe. I deserve to experience all of my love. Join me in these I am thoughts. I am an expression of love. Connecting in love with all that lives and all that breathes. I am spirit, manifest in a beautiful form. I am the place where heaven and earth meet. It's wholly safe to embrace the truth about you. Holy safe to send the precious breath, spirit in form into every cell, expanding your aliveness, relaxing at deeper and deeper levels. safe and innocent, an expression of love. Choosing wisely in every moment what to think, how to use your life energy. Now I invite you with the breath to pay very keen attention to the sensations in your physical body right now. And listen in now to what you most want to express. What is it that you most want to say or do in this moment of time? Listen. Be the one who is listening to you. <clears throat> and now gently listen in for what you want for yourself. As a result of being here in this moment, thank you. Thank you for listening. Listening in and coming out into a precious, peaceful life. Yes. It's a breath bath. <laughs> Alchemy, my darling. Alchemy. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it just occurred to me is that it's really quite amazing that something that we are frightened of and disturbed by and hurts can actually turn into something that is beautiful and nurturing and ecstatic. <laughs> you know, you mentioned that, that your, your second child, your, the birth was literally orgasmic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I teach is the importance of learning how to relax into intensity. And uh, because joy is intense, love is intense, profound peace is intense, not just fear and pain, those things are intense. So it's really beautiful. My experience is that we're, we, you use the analogy of a stack of books, but I think of that game we play with dominoes where you stand them all up and you knock one over and brrr, everything falls. And so I love that your, your work really takes people to those really earliest moments upon which all of our other thoughts and habits and tendencies are built. And if you really want to change your life, you change those early thoughts, those early impressions, and all the stuff that was built on top of them just collapses. So there's the other thing I heard and I can't, so what you, what part of your process is, well, we used to think in terms of affirmations, like a, a seed that you plant in your consciousness to achieve a desired result. And if I compare thoughts like, wow, I'm a beautiful divine being of light, and I compare that thought to I'm a no good bum who's never going to amount to anything, and imagine people walking around with those thoughts. Which one of those thoughts do you think <laughs> would result in a life that's more fun? So I think a lot of it is because we're dealing with the unconscious and we don't even, I mean, if it was conscious, it wouldn't be a problem. We'd know about it. But the fact is you're trying to lead people to things that we are unconscious of. And those are the things that control us and drive us the most. Yeah. I yeah. think affirmations as points of contemplation. I don't, you know, I think, you know, um, just saying, oh, I'm a beautiful being of light. Yes, indeed, if you're really taking it in, if you really are owning it and, and allowing it to occupy your cells, that's one thing. But just to kind of throw around an affirmation is like, you know, putting leftovers in on top of old leftovers. It's not going to work. We used but to say painting a rusty ship. <laughs> yeah. yeah, affirmations, I think, are points of contemplation that you listen to. And you, what does that truly mean? And how does that how does that feel in my body? You know, it's um, um, it's it's a process being alive and it's a process working with all of this. It doesn't happen overnight. And people really deserve to be in the presence of people who are working from an integrated experience. Mm -hmm. You know, just being in your presence, Dan, people get it, you know, <laughs> really. Well, and you know, my great... That too, you know, but I mean, we've been at it for a long time, you know. Yeah. You know, I think affirmations for me become more, they're more like declarations, you know? Yes, um, yes, that's what they become. Right. It's more of a reflection of how I actually feel. And, it's, and there's a really beautiful kind of experience when you actually feel something starting to lose its power over you and another thought beginning to motivate and inspire you. I mean, I... We, we, Sandra Ray and, and Marcus are in this summit also when they talk about birth patterns and so on. But I, one of the unconscious thoughts that I had growing up was people hurt me. And I, I never said it out loud, but that's what I, that was my, that's why I was resonating. That's what I was, you know, putting out like a radio signal. And sure enough, every day or almost every day, somebody would hurt me. 
And, it, and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And even I was up into adulthood and I'd be minding my own business sitting in a bar and some guy would say, what are you looking at? And the next thing I know, he was hurting me. <laughs> I'm going, what's happening here? And, uh, and, and I, when I met Leonard Orr, the first thing he said to me, he says, you don't think you deserve love. And nobody had ever said that to me. What do, you, I, I never, what do you mean I don't deserve love? What are you talking about? He said, I want you to start saying that to yourself constantly. And I even had a shirt that said, I, Dan, deserve love. And then it, everything over the next couple of years totally shifted. And it's, it sounded stupid for me to say people hurt me because it didn't happen anymore. Yeah. Everywhere yeah. I went, people loved me. <laughs> And, and, and it wasn't an affirmation. It was like, well, I go to a strange place and new people and they love me. What the heck's going on? It used to be I'd go into a place and I was expecting they were going to hurt me. And I learned all kind of martial arts and I learned techniques to like protect myself from my own invention. <laughs> so, and um, you bring up such beautiful stuff in people, uh, Benny, and that's, that's, I love your work. And I think clearing away these stupid thoughts that we have you know, on one level just puts us in a place where we can actually begin to experience some of our own beauty, some of our own purity, and we see it in other people, even when they don't see it in themselves. Okay. And so we become change agents. I think that's what breathwork does. Well, the changes that I deeply want to see are in our birthing practices. Yes. It's slowly but surely happening. But, and we do not honor ourselves or our children by the way we treat beings coming in. And we end up with dysfunctional societies, dysfunctional we uh, end up social. <laughs> Darling, you know that in, nine, in the 1960s, of all things, um, Oh, God, what was his name? Anyway, he was a uh, head of psychology um, at the Institutes for Health in the United States when it was a very integrous organization. And um, he said that the, the origins are vi of violence are right there in the delivery room. Wow. That was in the 60s, and it has gotten worse because of, oh, so many things. Big Pharma taking over even more, um, people being terrified of being sued. So everything is based, the whole system, especially in the United States, is, is based on fear. Fear of litigation. Fear the baby's going to die. Fear of pain in birth. So women go to birth preparation class so they can find out how to make it not hurt. Well, the operational thought is it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it boggles my mind, you know. So yeah. I, I really, that, that's what I want to see because... Our, our, our systems cannot survive, really. We keep gathering information, but we're not actually acting on it in the ways that we could. We, we, we know that thought is creative and we know that we need to change our minds. And one person at a time, yes, and changing birth, one birth at a time. But I would like to see a bigger shift. I would like to see people living in peace with one another, which is wholly possible. But not if you assault the person coming in. If you are assaulted when, I mean, you know, you thinking, Somebody's going to hurt me. Where do you think you, that came from? It came from your experience on the delivery table, and nobody meant to hurt you. But they did, and they took you away from mother, you know? So we really, really have to think about this. I want to 
Oh, I've got a picture right here. I want to show you something. <laughs> that little girl is five minutes out of the water, maybe eight minutes, 10 minutes out of her mother. She's not screaming. She's happy as Larry. Look at her. <laughs> She's meeting God. She's meeting the one. Mm -hmm. And that happens. I've seen it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Oh, we wow. Greet, greet every baby every human being born, greet them with, thank you for loving us so much. Then yeah. we go through life knowing that we're lovers. Mm. Think about that. Yeah. But, and we can say it to our children right now and we can say it to our lovers right now. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring about me, Dan. <laughs> you know, it's true that hurt people hurt people and healed people heal people. And so we need to do our own work so we can begin to uplift everybody. You are, you are one of those people in the world that's just uplifting uh, everyone around them. So how, how do people find you? Uh, you know... If people want to do more work with you, if they want to dig deeper into this process, the source process, how do people find you? www.binnyadansby.com <laughs> Yay. And I suppose if you Google source process, it'd be hard not to find you, huh? <laughs> right. Source process and breath work. And if you Google me, you can find me. Yes. Yeah. I think there's a gift that goes along with this. I'm giving away oh, the yes. Source Meditation, which is the the archetypal affirmations. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Wonderful. Phew. Well, I could talk to you forever, and I and I intend to be talking yes, with you indeed. forever. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going, darling. But uh, have you got you know any final thoughts uh, just to kind of leave us with? Take I love you in on the breath. I'm here for you. Take it into your body, into your being with the, with the inhale. So that when you exhale, it's released. Mm. I love you. Mm. Beautiful. Well, everyone, changing ourselves one breath at a time, changing the world one breather at a time. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Benny, for sharing your wisdom with us. And I think we are all set for now. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Benny.